we can take our Bibles and be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We began a few weeks ago a series of messages that uh, I have called, based on the theme of the book, The Strength of Weakness. That sounds like a paradox. It is. The Strength of Weakness. And one of the things that we've uh, already encountered uh, in the ninth verse of chapter one, Paul says, we were so oppressed. It was like we had the sentence of death in ourselves, but here's why, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. There is the key. That is the strength of weakness, where we are brought to a point where we have to acknowledge and admit our own strengthlessness, our utter weakness, so that then we can call upon the Lord, we can depend upon him for his strength because we're insufficient. Well, the last time that we looked in 2 Thessalonians in the first chapter, first 11 verses, we answered the question, why God allows you to hurt. Well, the rest of the chapter 1, verses 12 through 24, deals with misunderstandings that develop between leaders and people in a local church. Here it's Paul and the church there in Corinth. And his desire to get it straightened out as, as soon as possible and also to be vindicated. Here's what happened. Paul had plan A, but ended up working out plan B. Plan A, if you wonder what that is, is in this chapter, verses 15 and 16, where he says, And in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit or a double blessing and to pass by you into Macedonia and come again out of Macedonia unto you and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. Now, what he's saying is simply this. He's writing this from the city of Ephesus on the other side of the Aegean Sea from Corinth. And what he's saying is, I want to take a, a ship from, uh, from uh, Ephesus. I want to take a, a, a ship directly to Corinth and visit you and then go up into the northern area of Greece. Corinth was in southern Greece. Go up into the northern area of Greece and then on my way back, visit you a second time and then have a couple of you accompany me as I take a ship then back to Israel, back to Judea and to deliver the, the money to the, the needy believers there. Well, that didn't happen. And he tells us what happened instead uh, back in the last chapter of 1 Corinthians. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 to 9, he says, Now I will come to you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. It shall be that I will abide and winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey wherever I go. I'll not see you now, by the way but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Why? A great effectual door is open to me. There are many adversaries. It didn't work out that Paul would go directly from uh, the, the city of Ephesus to Corinth, then go north into Greece, and then come back to Corinth. Instead, he went from Ephesus and he went to northern Greece, and he visited Philippi and Thessalonia, and then he got down to Corinth. And so he didn't get to Corinth two times like he said he was going to, and he didn't go directly to Corinth like he said his plan was. So he swapped plan A for plan B, and this switch cost caused a lot of misunderstanding in the church because there were people in the church at Corinth that were out to get Paul. 
They were gunning for him. They wanted to uh, gain leadership for themselves. And so they were looking for anything that they could latch on to, to accuse Paul of either not being serious, being insincere, uh, not being forthright. And so there's a big misunderstanding like that that he's dealing with here in the rest of this chapter. You know, it really hurts sometimes when people misunderstand good intentions that you have. Uh, misunderstandings and being misjudged by people can be very hurtful. Well, the passage that we're looking at here in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 1 really shows us steps that we can take as individuals to avoid misunderstandings and uh, when we can avoid them, how to properly handle them. That is the way God would have us to handle them when people misjudge us. You know, maybe they misjudge something we say or something that we do. You know, I find, I find it uh, the more you talk, the more opportunity there is for people to misunderstand what you're saying. And that's, uh, that's a problem that we preachers have because uh, it's our responsibility to talk a lot. And so we give more opportunity for people to misunderstand. That's why we need to be careful and always try to clarify things as well. But there are four components that I want to go over with you in, briefly as I can. Four components that are mentioned in this second half of, of this chapter uh, to help avoid and also to handle misunderstandings in a local church like this and like at Corinth. And the first one is in verse 12. Note it, note it with me. He says, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, not with worldly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, that is our living, our lifestyle in the world, and more abundantly to your word. If I can just boil all that verse down into one thing, here is the first step that any of us can take to avoid being misunderstood and thus being misjudged. And that step that he's talking about here is integrity. Integrity. Paul said, what I am going to talk to you about regarding this misunderstanding, he says, I'm speaking from a totally clear conscience. You see, Paul knew that he was innocent. And when you know you're innocent, you can have total confidence that uh, your motives are pure and uh, that you're sincere. And Paul is going to communicate to them on the basis of his integrity that from changing from plan A to plan B, he only did it because it was in their best interest and not his. He's not, to, uh, mis uh, don't misunderstand what Paul's doing here in these verses. He's not doing what is today called damage control. That's not what he's doing. He's not doing damage control, but... Uh, uh, Regardless how these people perceived Paul's actions, he says in verse 12, my conscience is clear before God. I have a clear conscience. And so let me just say this. When you're misunderstood, when you're misjudged by people, the first question perhaps that we ought to ask ourselves is this. Is there anything about what I said or what I did that is displeasing to the Lord. That's a good way to check yourself and your integrity. And then also, perhaps to follow that up by asking, is there anything in what I said or did that is wrong? And so you're checking yourself and uh, you're conscious about any part of those questions. Did you, when you said what you did, did you say it 
Or did you do it having lost your temper? Even though maybe what you said, what, what uh, you were saying or what you're doing was, was good, was right, but did you do it in the wrong way? Did you do it having lost your temple, temper? Or did you, did you, the way you talked, your tone, was it right? Did you do or say what you said or did to retaliate? And if so, the first step is get it right with the Lord. Confess it to the Lord. Clear your conscience first with the Lord. That's what integrity is about. And then, if need be, you can clear your conscience with the people that you sinned against, okay? So integrity, in verse 12, is the first way to avoid misunderstandings. Have a clear conscience. And then, secondly, look at verse 13. For we write none other things unto you than what you read or acknowledge. I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. What's he saying in that 13th verse? He's setting the table to show that in his integrity, he also has been dealing with them in transparency. Here's a very important part of avoiding being misjudged or misunderstood. Paul is saying, I did not behave when I changed from plan A to plan B. I was not behaving erratically. This is normal, consistent behavior with me. I follow the will of the God. Of God. Uh, I'm being straight up with you. I'm being upfront with you. I'm being honest and open and transparent. I'm not deliberately leading people on by saying one thing and having a hidden agenda and actually doing something else. I'm being truthful is what Paul's saying in verse 13. I want you to understand that. I'm being transparent with you. Uh, this is something that is so important in our relationships interpersonally, whether it be in a family or in a spiritual church family like this, that, that we are transparent with each other, that we're truthful with each other, that we don't uh, say one thing and mean something else that uh, Paul saying, I'm not trying to be sneaky here. I'm not trying to be deceptive. I'm not speaking with double meanings. Uh, I'm not deliberately being vague. May I say that what we say when it is an important part of our dealing with people, that we speak not in vague terms, but in very clear, understandable, we, we need to have clarity in our dealings with people. It's like Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Let your word be your bond is basically uh, what we're talking about when we talk about being having transparency. Never make promises that either are impossible to you to keep or that you never intended to keep in the first place. This is very important in our relationships, in our families, and in our church family. Don't make promises that are impossible for you to keep or you never intended to keep to begin with. That's a need for transparency. But there's a third thing that I wanted to call to your attention, verses 15 to 17. We're talking about how to avoid and how to handle misunderstandings, being misjudged. And in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before that you might receive a second benefit. That is the benefit of, my, of me visiting you two times. And to pass by you into Macedonia and to come again out of Macedonia unto you. and uh, of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. Wherefore, I was therefore thus minded when I was thinking that way, when that was my plan A, was I using lightness? Didn't I mean it? 
the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? Do I, am I basing it on just human worldly uh, thinking? That with me, there should be yay, yay, and nay, 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 that there should be yes and no. Here's what he's saying here. He's saying, let's identify the problem. <laughs> and this is a very important part of avoiding or dealing with misunderstandings is what I call identity. That is explaining, identifying the problem, explaining it so you can clear it up. And the thing that really is important when it comes to identifying the problem is that it's an urgency. It's urgent. There, there's a real effort on Paul's part to immediately try to clear up any misunderstanding that uh, folks there at the church may have gotten. It's very important for us to maintain as good a relationship with one another as we possibly can. Again, whether it be in your home or whether it be in your church family or anywhere. You, you remember that what Paul says in Romans chapter 12? He says, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And so in order to do that, it's urgent that you identify and, uh, and uh, properly explain the problem. Believers are not permitted to simply ignore relationship problems. You know how important it is that we urgently deal with them? Jesus himself said in the Old Testament setting that if you bring your gift to the altar, if you bring your sacrifice to the, the priest uh, to sacrifice on that altar to the Lord, and when you do so, you realize that your brother is offended by you or that you've offended your brother. Forget about the worship part. <laughs> Put it on pause. You go and get right with your brother and then come and worship God. This is how urgent it is. This is how important it is that we explain uh, the identity of the problem so as to clear it up. If you're upset, if, or if you think that a brother in the Lord or a family member is upset with you, it's necessary that as soon as possible, you try to get it straightened out. You know why? Because the Bible also makes it very clear that unresolved problems between people will fester into a poisonous bitterness that will not only mess you up, but will defile the entire family or the entire church family. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. Paul says this in Ephesians 4, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And I would even say that as he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, it will extinguish the Holy Spirit's working in people's lives that have a festering bitterness in them. And so that's why we need to deal with these kinds of misunderstandings as soon as possible. Do it, ur it it's, it's urgent. But when we do so, when we are identifying the problem, when, we're, when we are explain when we're giving an explanation of the identity of the problem so as to clear it up, we not only need to be urgent, but we need to be accurate. We'll never solve any problem until we are exact in identifying what that problem is. In this case, it was simply that Paul changed his mind, that Paul changed his plans. He ditched plan A for plan B, and apparently some people in the church that were opposed to the Apostle Paul were very upset, and they were unwilling to give their brother in Christ the benefit of the doubt. Can I pause there a moment? Give brethren the benefit of the doubt. Don't just jump to the conclusion because this happened. This must be why. Give believers the benefit of the doubt. They were unwilling to do that for Paul. Rather, they took his changing or switching his plans as an opportunity to say, you know what's wrong with Paul? 
He's insincere. And he's not trustworthy. We can't trust him. He just operates on a worldly level. That's what it means by carnal wisdom. He's just operating on the same level that the world operates on. He just say, says things at times uh, that he thinks people want to hear. He's really uncommitted. And uh, he doesn't really bother keeping his word. Let me give you some personal application here in that point. And that is this. They were saying that Paul only does or says what's convenient at the moment. It is vital that we as believers are absolutely truthful and that we do mean what we say. Listen to me. If you say that you're going to do something, if you commit yourself to doing something, always honor your commitment, even if it's at personal cost to you. The psalmist says in Psalm 15, I think it's verse 4, he says that the righteous man, he sweareth to his own hurt. In other words, no matter if it's a personal sacrifice costly to him, if he says he'll do it, he's going to show up and he's going to follow through and he's going to do it. Now, I could give some illustrations of uh, how this often doesn't happen, even in a local church where we sign up for things and we don't follow through or don't do that because this is what Paul is being accused of, of just being fickle and insincere and not real and just being ex whatever is expedient or convenient at the moment for him. And that's not Paul at all. And so this is the thing that, there has to be this identity that is an explanation that identifies the problem and clears it up. It's urgent and it has to be accurate. And then the, the uh, fourth and final thing, which is the rest of the chapter, verses 18 to 24, I call that part theology because there's good Bible truth that is taught in the remaining verses about God, about the, the believer's relationships in the rest of this chapter, if our relationships with one another aren't right, you know what it does? It's a blot on the name of the Lord. And so most importantly, we want to deal with misunderstandings and misjudgments of others so that there's no blot on the Lord's name. We want to clear the Lord's name. Our name, you know, is one thing, but we want to clear the name of the Lord. And Paul was God's representative. And so he was very diligent in this. So I want you to look at verse 18 with me. He says, but as God is true, our word to you was not yes and no. <laughs> our your word was not yes and no. He says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silas and Timothy, that gospel that we preached, it was not yes and no, but in Christ, it was yes. It was yes. In fact, verse 20, for all the promises of God in Christ are yes, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. In verses 18 to 22, he's basically saying this. This is good theology. He's telling us that in dealing with misunderstandings in which you're misjudged, you have, to un you have to stand upon some good theology here. And the theology he's referring to is the provision that we have in Christ. Christians should not give yes and no commitments. Our commitment has to be either yes or no. They, it can't be both because it's against the very nature of God. In fact, he goes on to say that God's promises in verses 18 and 19, God's promises to us that are available in Christ are always yes. They're always positive. And all that God's promises, by the way, are yours in Christ. That's what verse 20 is telling us. All the provision that God promises to the believer 
is available to every believer in Christ or through Christ. But it's only when you step out in obedient faith and you say, amen, God, I believe it. And you claim it by faith for yourself. That's what the second part of verse 20 means. Look at it. I want you to get this. The first half of verse 20, all the promises of God in him, that is in Christ, are yes. Simply means this. All the provision that God promises to us are available in Jesus Christ. Okay? I think we get that. Right? But the second half of the verse, and in him, amen, we're the ones that say amen. God says yes to us in the provision that he gives us in Christ, but he wants us to step out in obedient faith and say amen to what God promises. When we say amen, it, it means let it be. It, 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 when we say amen, we're saying, I believe you, Lord. I believe that you are that you promise this, that you provide this for me. And I want to claim it by faith for myself. That's what verse 20 talks about. That's what the amen, you say the amen. Jesus is the yes. You're the amen. You're the one that by faith claims his promises by saying, I believe it. And I claim it for myself because you promised it. In other words, the ability to understand and obey is given us by God. Look at what he says in verse 21 and 22. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You know what he's saying there? He's saying our ability to understand all that God promises, all of his provision to us, the ability to understand God's provision for us, and to step out in faith and claim it, say amen to it, is because of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. It is through the Holy Spirit that indwells us. Notice how the Holy Spirit is pictured here in verses 21 and 22. All Christians are not only indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but he says are anointed by God, are anointed by the Holy Spirit. When it talks about the Holy Spirit anointing us, it's talking about his enabling us, the power that he gives us to act based on our trust, our dependence upon him. All believers are anointed with Holy Spirit enablement, but in verse 22, we're also sealed with his ownership. The Holy Spirit that indwells believers. If we depend upon him, he will enable us. He anoints us. He enables us. And he also seals us, which is a mark of his ownership, which means the Holy Spirit in you is never going to leave. He seals you. You know, back in that day, they would, uh, if they sent a letter of correspondence, they would uh, seal the envelope with a wax, melted wax on the, on the envelope to seal it. And then they would, while that wax was still warm, they would put their signet ring or their stamp into that soft wax so it would be seen to be an official sealed letter. And this is the Holy Spirit is the seal of God's ownership of the believer's life. Because God owns you, he indwells you, and as a result, he anoints you, he enables you to proffer from the very provision that God says, this is yours. He's that yes, and we say amen to that. But notice also, in that 22nd verse, it says the Holy Spirit that God gives us not only seals us as his possession, but the Holy Spirit is given as the earnest in our hearts, as God's earnest in our hearts, or you might say God's deposit 
or God's down payment that guarantees that all the provision that God offers to his people are yours in Christ. The Holy Spirit living in you not only guarantees that one day you're going to be, your body's going to be redeemed, obviously, but it's present tense here that all the provision of God is yours now. That's what it means when it says what he does, that the Spirit is God's deposit or down payment. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That means that all the provision that you find in the New Testament is yours now. And the spirit living in you, the spirit indwelling you, is God's guarantee that the provision is yours. And then look at verses 23 and 24. Here's another. Not only does the good theology that he gives us here talk about the provision we have in Christ, but look at verses 23 and 24, the direction that we have in Christ. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as unto yet unto Corinth, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. Here Paul is simply summing it all up, and he's telling, you know why I switched from plan A to plan B? Simply because I was led by the Holy Spirit to do so. It's not because I had a whim. It's not because it wasn't convenient for me, but it's because I'm led by the Spirit. And you remember what he said when he explained his, his plan A in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 that I've already read to you. Uh, he said, I, I'm planning uh, to come and I, I want to tarry a while with you. And then he puts this down. If the Lord permit. Okay. In other words, if it's God's will. And so it's very clear that uh, the theology that Paul wants us to get to try to solve this misunderstanding that he's being misjudged by is, look, I'm just following God's direction. I didn't change plans on a whim. I was not permitted to follow plan A. God instead led me to take plan B. But why would God do that? Well, he says in these verses, if you read what he says here, he said, it's because I, uh, I was to realize that blessing for you as a church would be through the Holy Spirit's plan B instead of my original plan A. And I'm just obeying the Holy Spirit. And that's why I have a clear conscience, because I want the Holy Spirit to bring the, the necessary change in you and not through my strong, forceful personality. You know, Paul, when he wrote his letters, I mean, they were powerful. And he said, I want to come and have you do it just because I apply the, the screws to you, because I twist your arm. You know, th th there's things that as a, as a spiritual leader, I see in, in people's lives, and oh, I, I want to talk to them. I want to change that in them. But the Lord doesn't allow me to. <laughs> the Lord says, give, give space to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit work. He can do a much better job. It doesn't happen as quick as I want it to. But over a period of time, when the Holy Spirit, when God does it and I don't do it, what a blessing that is. And it's just really a matter of faith on my part. I have to be willing to be led by the Spirit of God to go when I'm supposed to go and stop when I'm supposed to stop, to say something when I should say something and not say something when he tells me to shut up and let God do the work. And so this is what Paul's saying. I, I got my direction from the Lord. And it's very important that Spiritual leaders are not dictatorial. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 3, that um, he was not, uh, it's not right for elders to be lords over God's possession, over God's heritage, over God's flock. And so we as spiritual leaders have to be very careful 
that we're we're not dictating to people. You need to do this. You need to do that. Don't do this. You got to figure this out in your walk with the Lord. You got to come to the place where it's not me telling you as a pastor what you should and should not do. But you need to learn to listen to the voice of God, discern the still small voice of the Spirit, and let Him lead you in your life. I'm not here to be your to, to, to tell you what you should and should not do. And sometimes people come to me, and I don't, I'm not saying you shouldn't. They come to me for with 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 Bible questions or whatever, or advice. And sometimes I just say, Well, look at this verse. Well, check out this chapter. Well, look at this passage, and uh, what do you think on the basis of that you should do? Instead of me telling them, let the Holy Spirit of God take the Scripture and show them what he would have them to do. This is, we need to learn to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, because only when you're led by the Holy Spirit can you then be enabled, empowered by him. And so this is what Paul's saying. You know what his real motivation for changing his plans were? Obviously, it was the Spirit's direction. But look at what he says here in the in the um, in these closing verses. He says um, in verse twenty three, "I call God to for a record upon my soul." Here's here's what's going on in my head, in my inner man, that to spare you, I came not. You know why I changed plans. It wasn't because I couldn't make up my mind, I was indecisive, or it wasn't convenient. The real motivation for me from changing from plan A to plan B is because I'm con my consideration is for you, not for myself. I want to spare you. In other words, I am in the ministry for you, not for myself. The ministry is about others. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about ministering or serving others. And that's what he's talking about here. I thought about reading a, a passage. I think I have a few minutes uh, from a missionary, uh, a collection of missionary excerpts from missionary biographies. This is about Jim Elliott. You all heard of Jim Elliott, the uh, martyred, uh, one of the martyred missionaries in, in Ecuador. Here's what the, the author says. He says, Elliot splashed across the Cure River toward the approaching uh, Waroni visitors. His companions called ahead to him, warning him not to rush and frighten away their first contacts. Barely clothed, a young man, a woman, and a teenage girl emerged from the jungle. 28-year-old Elliot should have been the one afraid. Until that point, most encounters with the while Roni, uh people of Ecuador ended in bloodshed. For three days, starting January 3rd, 1956, Elliot, Pete Fleming, Roger, Udarian, Ed McCulley, and Nate Saint had camped out on the sandy riverside of what they called Palm Beach. The goal was to make friendly contact with the feared Waroni. Elliot and his team hoped that they could one day share the gospel with him. For days, no one came. Then on January 6th at 11, Elliot and his team made first contact. Months of preparation and gifts dropped from Nate Saint's yellow Piper uh, cruiser airplane to the Rani uh, below had paid off. Three visitors seemed quite pleased to meet the five missionaries. The Waroni men even flew in Nate's plane and waved to their friends below. The women chattered away on the beach, even though the foreigners couldn't understand them. All enjoyed a sampling of lemonade and hamburgers that the men fried for their new friends. Against all odds, the team's dreams of establishing a gospel outpost to this unreached tribe seen on the cusp of realization. Where did Elliot find the courage to venture into the danger for the cause of Christ? his relationship with Christ emboldened him to advance the gospel where no one else had gone before. It came through years of preparation and devotion to Christ. In addition to uh, the word of God, El uh, Elliot supplemented his Bible reading with Bible uh, with biographies of people that God used in the past. The daily 
spiritual discipline of time alone with God, augmented by example of faithful servants of God, shaped his view of life. Eliot's spiritual preparation led him to risk his life for the spread of the gospel. He counted the cost. He read of martyrs. He, he had seen the spears in the Ecuadorian jungle. Despite his team's careful preparation, Eliot understand that, understood that first contact with the secluded people could lead to misunderstandings, violence, and even death. Just two days after sharing hamburgers with the Waroni at the riverside, Elliot and his team felt their spears. God orchestrated Elliot's martyrdom as the first motif in a symphony that four years later would climax with a gospel movement among the Waroni people. Furthermore, Elliot's example of dedication to God and passion to reach the unreached inspired hundreds of new missionary recruits to follow him as he followed Christ. Why did I share that? Because this is what ministry is about. It's uh, about not worrying about yourself or counting your life dear to yourself, but uh, following the will of God and the direction of the Holy Spirit, regardless of what the cost might be. Sad to say there are, there are Christian parents that would never allow their children to enter into danger like that because they count their lives dear unto themselves. And as a result, their children miss the will of God because their parents hold them back. Don't be a father like that. Don't be a parent like that. Be a parent that realizes that your children don't belong to you. They belong to God, and they're loaned to you for a short time, and you're raising them for his, for his will, for his purpose in their lives, and you hold them out willingly with open hand to hand them over to the Lord for whatever he wants them to do, however he wants to use them, even if it's life-threatening where he would lead them. This is what Paul's saying. And this is, uh, I think, why he's misunderstood. Because there were people that wanted deliberately to misinterpret his actions in order to discredit him so that they could usurp leadership and authority instead. 